Okay, please come in, take seats. Hang on, we're going to uh, talk about blockchain. If you're not familiar with the concept, and you know, frankly, who really is? It's this is like when the internet so suddenly was beginning to emerge, and people said, "Well, what's it going to do? What's it look like? How does it work?" Um, and it took a long time for us to begin to get a handle on that. So we've got three speakers who have a wealth of knowledge and varying approaches with how to handle and authenticate the chain of information associated with infrastructure. And they believe this blockchain technology uh, will really begin to play a, uh, just a major role in that in the years ahead. Um, so come on up, uh, Tom Winling, Systems Engineer at Jacobs Engineering. Bassam Handy, you may recall him from some of his other roles in the industry. These days he is CEO of Rick's Chain. And the third panelist is the founder and director of the Integrated Engineering Blockchain Consortium, Dan Wells. Uh, please welcome to them all. So let's just launch right in. Um, and we want Tom to, to lead off um, because he's sort of on the kind of focusing from the user side, uh, the engineering uh, company side. What's it going to mean, Tom? All right. So before I uh, jump into blockchain, I want to just say a little bit about Jacobs, provide a, a very basic overview. We are 77,000 employees, um, 15 billion in revenues. We merged acquired CH2 Hill uh, last December. And um, it's kind of interesting. I remember two years ago, I was in a meeting with Jackie Hinman, the then CEO of CH2 Hill. And she said something very interesting that stuck with me for a long time. She said that the single biggest existential threat to CH2 Hill and to any major AEC incumbent, such as Jacobs, is that um, Someone may devise some digital means for organizing engineering and architectural talent that could compete directly with our way of doing things. And it's, um, it's something that, uh, of course, it's alluding to this whole phenomenon of uh, movement from centralized to decentralized, proprietary to shared resources. And if anyone needs a reminder, Uber and Airbnb, they're just three blocks away from here, if you need to uh, refresh yourself what that means. And in those two years, uh, we haven't lost sight of that threat. It's somewhat speculative, but it hasn't really appeared on the horizon yet. Uh, we think that blockchain technology, uh, and more importantly, all the capital that has been raised over the last 12 years using blockchain technology might actually be the, uh, the nucleus of such a threat in the future. And what we're doing is, uh, through an open innovation model, an open innovation exchange model, actually participating with uh, <coughs> startups, incubators, accelerators, and a vast distributed network of blockchain developers. We have no shortage of blockchain talent, blockchain developer and strategic talent. Uh, these are the very same people who have actually invented blockchain, and, and some say we'll probably have the very last word in what blockchain will mean to our industry and how it will transform society. So how can it be a threat to us? Um, it's very interesting that uh, blockchain technology is, uh, uh, allows the formation of, uh, uh, of engineering uh, platform cooperatives. It quite bluntly allows engineers, architects, any kind of technical professional really to open source themselves. Uh, it allows them to be independent, disintermediated in a way that we haven't seen in 150 years. Uh, I don't know if you know the history of architecture, but Frank Lloyd Wright was actually fired by his employer when he moonlighted and designed some beautiful homes in Oak, in, uh, Oak Park. Um, we, we don't really think of engineers as much as individual uh, practitioners and professionals as much as technical employees of large companies, but what we're seeing is the possibility that this could be reversed. So let me... Before we dive back into that again, I want to talk a little bit about an initiative at Jacobs called Jacobs Connected Enterprise. Uh, this is a cross-cutting, cross-business uh, entity cutting um, uh, entity within Jacobs that's responsible for accelerating our digital technologies to, to help uh, on behalf of our clients as well as ourselves to accelerate technologies. Um, 
But one of the most profound statements that we make in JCE is that we're not just an engineering company that gets technology, but we're a technology company that gets engineering. And in the Bay Area, that may sound quaint, coming from a, an engineering firm, a conservative, risk-averse, traditional AEC firm that has participated in a lot of uh, innovations over the last 30, 40, 50 years. But uh, let's face it, we are an industry that grew uh, pre-war a uh, little more technology than uh, drafting tables, telephones, and blueprint machines. What are we to make with the, the accelerating internet connected world that we're actually in? So getting into blockchain, what is blockchain? Um, it's a fair question. It's not so much about technology as it is social science. It's actually management science. It's behavior change in a dramatic way. It's social science and management science sandwiched between two layers of technology. Underneath you have this nourishing substrate of blockchain, which can actually host communities of professionals working with purpose and fueled by their own currencies. And above that, you can have neural networks, deep learning, to actually study their ways of interaction on a uh, immutable public ledger, and that can actually find subtle motivations about how and why people work and organize them into teams and, uh, and, and maybe initially only handle mundane routine tasks like designing a beam or doing estimates or uh, simple claims and validations of things. But the entire record of how people work together can be studied and can be mined using the AI that everyone's been talking about these last three days. So uh, the possibility of interleaving our organization with disintermediated layers of uh, engineers and architects, even actuaries, other technical professionals, uh, to make more efficient use of the white space in our org chart, to actually create the 21st, 21st century engineering firm, which is more of a cyborg, it's a sort of half internet company, half hierarchical traditional institution that we've all come to know and love, uh, is something that we're actually considering. Uh, as we announced that we're going to be a technology company that, uh, that gets engineering. So here's just a, a diagram of how that works. So you basically have a neural network and you have the uh, platform cooperative of engineers working on this blockchain substrate. And I'm going to leave it right there to be punctual. I have one more slide to talk about how we're actually applying this in infrastructure uh, to, to crowdsource data that can be, uh, can be used in a very efficient, more productive way than uh, what's currently being done. But I'm going to hand it over to Bassam and give you his turn. Uh, hi, I'm Bassam Hamdi. Um, Tom did mention that I've been in this industry for a while. Uh, this is probably my sixth time on the Future Tech stage over the last several years of this event. And uh, it's actually really exciting to be talking about, about the next wave of technology. Uh, I remember talking about web-based technology early on and then collaboration and mobile. And it's something that is new, blockchain, but really is at that same level. Just quickly, by show of hands, how many people actually know what a blockchain is? Yeah. All right. With our goal here was trying to explain to a large group of people what blockchain has always started a little bit with the Bitcoin discussion. Um, but what we've taken is a slightly different tact. And at Brickchain, we decided to look at what our current implementation of technology is. And then what does that current implementation result in from a problem set? So the problem that we're solving for is when an owner receives an asset, there's uh, data in the industry that shows that 95% of all data is actually lost or thrown away at handover. We've talked to several large asset owners, and they think it's even higher than that. So now that's the first owner of that building. Now, how about the next owner, or the owner after that? Where is all of that information going? So we talk about 2,500 startups in construction. We talk about 2,500 different databases. So the problem we're solving is data coordination through construction, most importantly at turnover, to allow an owner to get a register of every product in the geometry of their asset. So at some point, if an asset is proven to cause cancer, let's say, and they need to look at their portfolio and find that product, they actually have a place to go to actually find that information about their asset. Um, we talked a little bit about blockchain being a shared ledger, and there's different degrees of how public a ledger is. 
In the case of Bricks Chain, what will be called semi private. Each facility gets a private key, and people that are part of that facility build process gets a public key. So they can write to that facility if they so choose. Essentially, posting public data to that facility of what they've completed or what they want everybody within that supply chain to understand. What we're really trying to drive here is trust, transparency, and integrity. Uh, essentially, giving you a real world use case, if I've done an installation or something and I want to post that, that it has been completed, I can actually use any one of the technologies that are already in play. We are not trying to change behaviors. As long as that technology is blockchain aware, we'll bring in that block and actually publish it as an immutable block in the ledger against that facility. On top of our blockchain is a graph database. So we've created a graph of what an asset is. And starting at the Kobe model, if anybody's familiar with Kobe, we've modified that to create a standard graph so that people can actually understand what the physical delivery of their product is. Um, we don't build projects, we build buildings. And everybody's project is a little different. An architectural, an engineering, a general contractor, the subcontractor, everybody's kind of touching the elephant. Uh, the white elephant in the room is that you can't coordinate data unless you're taking it down to what you're actually building. Um, so that's what that graph database does. It designs a layer defining the digital twin of that building. Um, we talk about a single version of the truth. Really what we want to talk about is the truth. What is the truth of the building at an as-built level? and what will require everybody to be on that same page. Litigation is a huge issue in this industry. I think everybody knows that. Um, the reality is that it's a he said, she said, he said model, where wherever data is found, we're gonna sit through a series of discovery, we're gonna talk, we're gonna try to negotiate, and ultimately we're gonna come up with a settlement. I mean, it doesn't take long to walk to the Salesforce Tower and then look at the Millennium Tower next door and ask yourself, that contractor, who is a great contractor, is currently searching basements for the handover documents that were provided to the owner of that building. The reality is we do need a shared ledger. So that building has that information. Um, we have a joke around Brick's Chain, which is, I can go out and buy a 2004 you know, Honda Accord, go into Carfax, put in a VIN number and get more information than I would get buying a $300 million building. Um, that's got to stop. I mean, it, it seems like madness. We are building these massive assets that are meant to last 100 years, and nobody has any information of what's behind their walls. So um, that's where we started. The foundry is our blockchain layer. It is a fully implemented blockchain. This isn't anything that's in development. It is an alpha product, but it is a product. We have four pilot contractors running it right now around the handover product. So basically going out to subcontractors, architects and engineers, coordinating data to hand it over to owners. Um, we have one large REIT that will be mapping buildings that they already own in the blockchain. Um, and then we have a product called Chronicle. And what Chronicle does is after delivery of a project, tracks all information that's occurring, whether it's a TI, a change out, a renovation. All of that will be tracked in the blockchain. Again, we're not trying to change any behaviors. There are enough construction apps out there. We are not a construction app, but we connect to over 25 of them uh, to date, including Procore, uh, through a connection they have with Zapier. So whether it's a Google Drive file being dragged into a directory that is blockchain enabled, we can record that block, take a picture of that file at that moment in time, and make it immutable. Um, so we have a few goals, and I got 20 seconds left. So we want to be the Carfax of the building industry. Uh, we want to be open. We believe that there's a multi-chain world coming. Essentially, that we're going to have to talk between chains. So you know, if Jacobs goes and creates their own blockchain, we need to be able to consume that blockchain information. So we want to be open, and we do want to be a protocol. Uh, and finally, I think there is a version of the um, the construction industry that becomes intermediary free that we allow the craftsmen to be greater connected with the designers uh, to drive those, that, that uh, elusive productivity improvement. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Dan Robles. I'm um, founder and CEO of the Integrated Engineering Blockchain Consortium. And we are specific to the engineering profession. It's a blockchain for the engineering profession, which um, has similar goals as Bridgechain, but it's, it's, it's we sort of a different reason. We use a blockchain in a different manner. Uh, somewhat than, than most others are. Here's our first page. So the, the work kind of started back when I, I got involved with NAFTA and I went down to Mexico. And, and your first impression of a country like Mexico is that while the infrastructure isn't very good, therefore the engineers aren't very good. 
So I, I worked in the university and, and I was able to work with the engineers and, and I teach well, here, these are really smart, pretty people, they're smart engineers. So I sent them to the American PE exams, the EIT exams, and they did extraordinarily well. So you have to ask yourself, what's, what's the difference between, uh, you just measured them differently, how do you, how you reconcile the state of the infrastructure with this, this excellent engineer? It turns out that there's this, this three-legged stool between finance, insurance, and engineering. You cannot uh, finance a building without insurance. You cannot insure a building unless it's properly engineered. And you cannot get uh, any proper engineering without finance to cover the soft costs. So if you knock out one of those legs, the whole thing falls down. Okay, so there's a huge vulnerability in that state uh, of existence. So this kind of brought us to thinking in terms of risk removed from a system instead of systemic risk, instead of you know pricing engineered as a commodity product. product. So. Um, you know, and engineering is, the value of engineering is invisible. Like, uh, uh, you look at a building and um, the fireman is paid a million dollars an hour, or it's worth a million dollars an hour to put the building out, but the engineer, you never, the fire protection engineer, you, you don't know their value because there wasn't a fire to measure them by. So it, all this is in, ter is in terms of how do you measure the, the contribution of engineering or construction, what you guys do, to the overall economy. And to do that, you have to measure them differently. So if you were measuring them in terms of land, labor, and capital, you get lost in the fight in a different world. But if you measure what we do in terms of risk removed from the system, it all opens up a new opportunity for us. This couldn't have been done without blockchain. It can be done with blockchain. Um, we wrote the papers for the NSPE, the, AI, uh, the National Association of, of Insurance Commissioners, and we won the uh, innovation contest for the civil engineers on this idea that we should be converting our industry to a network instead of a hierarchy or this, the, the, where we are today. Um, and the network, we know what they are. They're, they're, they're the Googles, they're the Facebooks, they're, they're platforms, they're, they, they remove risk from the transaction and that's how they exist. So uh, um, I just mentioned the two futures of, of engineering. We can continue as uh, fighting with each other for commodity pricing or we can go off and become a platform uh, of our own. And if we don't do it, somebody else um, will probably do it for us. Um, I'm going to skip that slide. So I'm going to say right here, record, the, the biggest problem with blockchain, the entire environment, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of over analysis, there's a lot of under analysis, but right in the middle, the reality to all of this is the verification of the physical state. So we're talking about the digital twin. Um, I just spoke, spoke at the NetFounds conference and they talk about digital twins. Now, within a digital twin, you have artificial intelligence and, and uh, Internet of Things. All those components are within the digital twin model. Um, and there's a lot of work being done to that. But if you get bad data in there, if it's not validated, and it's not, then there's no consensus on what that physical item is, that data can propagate through your system and give you problems later, like problems of causation. You know, IoT, they know, they can tell you if it's snowing, they can tell you if it's cold, but they can't tell you uh, whether it's snowing because it's cold or it's cold because it's snowing. I mean, these are things you need a human to determine causation. And if you don't get it early, later on you can have a big mistake. So it's the validation of that, of that, uh, that place. We are right there in the middle. And we, are, we have to do a lot of work to define that physical state. So what we did is we created a native blockchain to the engineering profession, specific to the engineering profession, and we used a lot of game mechanics, uh, multi-agent algorithmic games. So what, what happens is an, an engineer will make a claim, uh, another engineer will validate that claim, and that forms an asset. And at that point, tokens are generated, given to each of those engineers. And those tokens serve to, as an incentive, and I'll show you how that works later. Now, each time there's a claim that goes onto the database, the, each of these claims. Now those claims, the node is the claim, but the branch to the other engineer is the, is the graph, as you say. So as, you, as you, you would start building this enormous network, which is what we call the in integrated body of knowledge for the engineering profession. So you have all the data is off on this integrated body of knowledge. What the blockchain does for us is it gives us a data logger. A lot of people are using it for a record, but it gives us a data logger, like you know, the, the paper goes by and this thing, and that synchronizes all of these events in time. And that now allows you to analyze anything about those events that you want. Um, so it's a very powerful thing to do. And now those, those tokens allow you to, to track these different points where risk is transferred from one individual to another. So it, it gets a little technical. I won't go too much deeper into that. But the, the mining of this database that we're forming is in the correct format to use quantitative analysis, to use actuarial math, so now you can start forming insurance products. You can start forming novel types of um, financial instruments. 
and you're plugging directly into the calculus of finance and insurance, and you've sort of bypassed the whole consumption production model in itself. So that is significant. So now our profession can live and exist as a platform as opposed to a, a hierarchy or, the, or, this, or this, 50, uh, this, this old world uh, way of doing things. I think that's the level of, of transformation uh, that we need to do. And um, we're, we're launching our, our blockchain in a couple of weeks. We've got funding from Switzerland and uh, we've got hundreds of engineers working on this and it's, it's a very, very interesting process of going through what we're doing. It's happening very interesting and very organic. There you have it. <laughs> uh, is there anything exclusive, mutually exclusive about your initiatives or are they collaborative and cooperative? Well, they have to be cooperative. Um, you know, what do they say? It takes a village. Well, it takes an army of people to build a building. Uh, and everybody has that piece of the story. So ultimately, if this is going to work, but the beauty of blockchain, of a distributed ledger, uh, sometimes it's easier to just call it a distributed ledger because blockchain has some connotations, um, is that everybody is kind of sharing one, one version of the truth, regardless if that information is being pushed to multiple chains or not. So if this is going to work, if we are going to make the industry better, um, we can't just come up with another app that creates another cascading, denormalized data approach. We need to come out with a data you know, protocol. And we all have to agree on this data protocol that essentially revolves around what is the delivered asset. We're not in the business to just you know, work for our day and then leave. I mean, we're building assets that endure for, you know, for our lifetime. And I think that's the exciting part of our industry. And the scary part of our industry is we're building an asset that people depend on in a life and death moment. And you know, we have bridges collapsing, we have buildings tilting, and it's not an acceptable situation anymore. It really not. I think to answer your question, Tom, yes, we are very collaborative. The three of us are really just the tip of a very large iceberg. And I mentioned before the community that we're members of. Uh, Jacobs actually helped uh, to found the Integrated Engineering Blockchain Consortium, which Dan runs. And we're also a community of collaborating AC firms, manufacturers, software companies, and this vast network of developers that I talked about before. So we have access to the talent. We're working together. We're sort of an exchange of innovation and development that uh, it's kind of open source at this point. It's too early to be competitive. We're still trying to get our bearings straight, uh, so we have to collaborate. And, and I think there's room for a lot of collaboration uh, between companies in this room um, to enter the same space and work together instead of... Uh, there, there are ways to collaborate that's not collusion. And, um, and blockchain itself, actually, the sharing of sort of information that it creates allows that in the next stage of, of its development. Yeah, and you see it in other industries, like like the insurance industry for health insurance. The CDC publishes all the mortality right. data and and you know how how, how lifestyles change stuff. And it's just a it's trivial that you can just go build insurance products from this because it's in the correct format to do so. Everybody is holding their data close, and there's a good reason. For, there's we're reacting to an uh, uh, improper situation, I'll say, but we're holding our data too close. If we were to put it out there, then all of us could use big data instead of being confined to our, our little data. Even a company as large as, as Jacobs is, is a small fraction of the entire industry. But if we had all the right data in the right format, you can use the advanced calculus and, and just don't um, neglect this. There's these powerful mathematical tools that allow us to analyze this data in magnificent ways. In, in things that could never be have been done um, before. Uh, we're not looking at calling the back office. That's what most people are using blockchain for, to get rid of all those pesky agents. We, you know, these are, there's a lot of things that could never be done before, but can now be done with this technology if we all work together. It will fail if we try to do it alone. There's just no question about that. Can we get the mic runners? I'm hoping there are some questions. So let's go, please raise hands and uh, engage. There's a question in the front. So I think, I think it's a great direction for the industry, and I agree data standards is an essential element. Um, talk a little bit about security. And um, obviously blockchain, uh, by its distributed nature, has an embedded strength to it. Uh, but uh, because it's not yet as ubiquitous, uh, in spite of Bitcoin, um, it hasn't attracted the attention of the talent of the world and the dark side. So my question is, um, how do you assure integrity? 
uh, how do you uh, uh, counter insiders, and many other yet to be imagined um, vectors of attack, um, so, so that we don't get um, uh, you know, the kinds of things that will disrupt uh, the benefits of this technology in the future. I, I, I think you're, let me just take a first stab at the question. I mean, I think everyone is aware that, uh, that blockchain could potentially have a very large attack surface. There are many points where, uh, where, where data could be um, messed up with, especially in the front end to these, these blockchains. And, and what's in the back end, yes, we always say it's, it's immutable and that it's, uh, uh, it's indelible and it can't be, it can't be tampered with. And, and that's probably true to some extent. And there are different consensus protocols that, that claim to have greater security than others, and greater efficiency for the security that's, that's gotten. But uh, th that's something that we're keenly aware of at Jacobs. In fact, we've uh, just completed two big acquisitions of, of companies last year that are specialized in cybersecurity, mostly for uh, the national government and for commercial banking as well. And we will be putting our cyber chops on this uh, application as it develops. But we're, we're very cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, security is a big issue on blockchain. In our case, um, we're using blockchain as a service. So it's hosted very similarly to as a SaaS solution. Our blockchain is uh, replicated across multiple nodes, across Azure and AWS. Um, including GovCloud. So the storage of our data is fully secure. Um, writing to the data requires access to the private key of the facility, so that provides another additional level of security. We chose an implementation path that didn't involve tokenization because we didn't want to create a public ledger. Um, we're currently shortlisted to chronicle a airport build in uh, overseas, and there's very little chance we would have gotten that opportunity to use a public ledger because they simply do not want those documents on a public blockchain. So um, that's the decision we made, and that's what we're going for from the security perspective. So we we look at let me give you a quick explanation of how it's secure. We use a different protocol called proof of stake, not proof of work. So it's a lot different than Bitcoin. But but here's an example. If you look at Hollywood, you know those credits at the end of the film. They're not. They go way. They go too fast. You can't read them. You're complaining. Well, they're not for your benefit. Those credits are there for the benefit of Hollywood. And what that's actually happening mechanically is as that frame is moving, that name is imprinted at a different location on that frame. And then they seal that frame and then they distribute thousands of, 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 of DVDs all over the world. So if I want to corrupt, the, change my, lie on my resume and say that I was uh, the actor of that, of that top hit, I would have to go and replace every single, the hundred of the different places where it was showing up on that film, and then I'd have to go corrupt every single DVD that's been distributed. The likelihood of that happening, or the likelihood that you would have uh, 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 something to steal that valuable that would justify that sort of expense, it just doesn't exist. So what we find is the blockchains are extraordinarily secure. It's the exchanges. When you leave the blockchain, and now you're exchanging your money for someplace else, there's that, there's that double spend problem start, that starts to exist there. Um, so the data, on our blockchain doesn't go on the blockchain, the person goes on the blockchain. The secret sauce to create that data goes on the blockchain. So your data never goes on the blockchain, but the people who created it, the people who validated it, they do. And they're incentivized to, it, what it does is it, in some way it, it pays the engineers royalties um, instead of renting time. So we're starting to see how we're moving over to that, to that platform level. There's a lot of advantages. To get there, you have to do things differently and take some chances. So we, we hopefully we've addressed a lot of those questions in doing that. Hi. Uh, this is Ashwas Rashid from Sandia. Uh, I wanted to ask about the um, data formats that you guys are talking about. And I wanted to go to the other end of the spectrum, where the fundamental data for the building today is not necessarily fully adopted as a standard format. Uh, what are your thoughts on the building data not being available because vendors are holding on to the proprietary data formats that are there? And what are your thoughts on that? Is that uh, effort on standardizing that because that is the fundamental data that needs to be standardized? And is that going to hinder your progress because the basic fundamental data is not industry standard and it is not available in the marketplace today? I, I mean, I could start. The, it's been a challenge. I mean, we've known each other a long time. We've been talking about BIM for a long time. And 
the, uh, the standardization hasn't occurred. Um, here's a challenge, and everybody's heard this story depending on how old their company is. It's like, we keep that Windows XP machine running because this product runs on Microsoft Access 97 and we still, we still need access to that data. And you just heard that story. Uh, the reality is, is that, you know, in your movie example, the, the actual property of the digital data is sitting on these old formats, VHS, beta, DVD, Blu-ray, and then digital, you know, digital copy. Ultimately, what we need to do is just forget about the file format and just think about the data in its most purest form, which is the locational data, the geometry, and the products that are actually within, uh, within that building. So unfortunately, what's ending up happening is a lot of people are handing over these great files for software companies that may not exist in three years, and that you'll never be able to open up that file format again. So we have to take everything down to the studs. We need to take everything down to what the data actually means in order to store that in blockchain. Um, so yeah, that's where we're going to have to There's a lot of proprietary data too that you mentioned that uh, I can just think of a situation of uh, an equipment manufacturer who doesn't want to release all the fabrication drawings and uh, then that manufacturer loses those drawings, um, <coughs> comes insolvent or whatever reason and the drawings disappear. And then 20 years down the road you have some large large drying equipment or something that has a component that needs to be replaced, but there's no records of how to build it anymore. So I can imagine in the future of specifying in RFPs that people have to leave that kind of data and put it on a blockchain. But it circles back to your, your question again, how do you even begin the standardization of, a, of an industry-wide infrastructure ledger of legacy data for, that, that's you know, commensurate with the longevity of infrastructure. Manufacturers usually don't live as long as the stuff that they build. Uh, so you need that immutability, that Im immortality, but you need standardization, you're right. And that's a mystery. I'm not going to pretend you know the answer right now for that, that question. So when we approached that problem, we, we looked at blockchain for different applications. One was um, a, a, a ride sharing service for private jets. And there's, it's so complex that you have, you don't have any, you, there's no discrete points. You can't build a business plan because there's so many variables. So we started looking at that in terms of probabilities. What's the probability the airplane will show up on time or whether it'll be okay, the ATC will be this. And that, you know, so that was kind of how we started seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Then we started playing around with blockchain and tokenization in construction several years ago. And we found out that what's happening on a construction site may be too complicated. The wall board guys don't show up, the plumbers stuck in traffic, everybody wants to get an eight hour day, and then you're, you're rescripting. And so it doesn't seem to be very practical on the floor. So what we're, con we're, we're, we're concerned with the point of risk transfer. Where does that data set go the responsibility of one person to another? When does the database go from the, process, uh, from the owner to the insurance company, the insurance company to the regulatory body, the regulatory body? So who's got access? And what are those points of risk transfer? So that's where we introduce a third party adjudicator or an oracle, you may have heard of that term. We deliver an oracle to that point in time to validate that data set. And then that closes the smart contract and allows it to continue. They're very easy to see these points in time. These points in time are very important to your funders and your insurance companies. So obviously there's a very high uh, value to them being secure. And we do it through people. Um, because ultimately, it, you know, what are we doing? We're, we're, it's a people thing. It's all about people. People create the value. The building doesn't create the value. The people do. So it's people-centric, and, and you know, securing these nodes is how we, we approach it. And we've been um, sandboxing it quite a bit and observing ourselves and how we behave and how we integrate with these tokens, the anthropology of tokens. Of tokens, it's just absolutely fascinating, and the, and the new incentives you can deliver, the incentive to share, you can increase, right now you get these people pouring data, but now you create a tokenization system where now their incentive is to share, and you can do that strategically. You can start really solving a lot of the people problems that you have. I, I agree that it's about people. I agree that it's uh, it's about the anthropology of work and how people work together. It's not just a new novel administrative technology for data management. Yes, that's a very important application of blockchain technology. It's extremely important. But it's about how people interact, and this idea of the tokenized ecosystem is something that we're very keen to observe and learn about. So, Dan, I'm glad you brought that up. I think one of the challenges in tokenization, obviously, is the teaching of a new behavior to individuals. And um, I think the concern, I mean, you can't buy anything with Bitcoin. I mean, anything that you could, you'd want to tell somebody that you bought with Bitcoin. So. <laughs> 
that the challenge of that is, am I going to tell an engineer, am I going to tell a subcontractor or contractor that they're going to get coin for doing something? So where we would like to tap in is we want to see blockchain hit the ground running as soon as humanly possible. The way you do that is we're tapping into known behaviors. There is a turnover process where general contractors are required to give owners what their building asset is. The owners get this in, literally one of our owners said they got a computer shipped to them that had the models on it. That was their turnover document. The other one we sat with in New York TC and their owner and they laughed about the fact that they never received a turnover package. I've done 10 projects with you, I've never seen one. And that's a legal requirement of that project. So let's give them a, a non-learned new behavior, let's just give them a platform that they can do turnover. And so the, the alternative to, um, and I think tokenization will have a great place one day in the industry, but I mean, we just want people to do what they're doing today, except organizing their data in a better way that's revealing to everybody. I think that's so I think you're saying let's start with what we've got rather let's than start with what we've got, right? And, yeah. uh, and but you're you're more of a transactional. Uh, we're, we're building a game. It doesn't take. It's a funny. It's, it's a multi-agent algorithmic game. The economy is already a game. You're already playing a game. Change the rules just a little bit, and now you can re you can shift the game in areas that you need to help it. It's always going to be a people thing. It's never. You can't shift the building. You have to shift the people. So you uh, you, you do the incentives in, in, a, in a certain way. Um, I guess the question is, and this is more, I didn't do a lot of research before we sat on the panel together, but I guess the question is, is Jacobs Engineering going to pay their engineers and tokens going forward? That's a very good question, okay. and I, I think the answer is probably probably not, but I, I want to sort of clarify this. This is turning into an argument in case you haven't received the change <laughs> in the tone of voice. So, so I, I want to kind of just really summarize like in 10 seconds. So, Basim, you believe their tokens should be out of the equation. No, uh, I don't and, actually. Or, or, <laughs> but your system, the, the, the blockchain that you're developing in that day, is, not not, is not token. And Dan, you believe in, in tokens for, again, for incentivizing, right. for, for you know, creating behavioral changes that right. create certain types of... All right, people, this is an argument, I believe, as important as the argument between Edison and Westinghouse, between AC and DC power. And it's going to have as much historical impact in the coming decades. So I just wanted you to be aware of it. And uh, Jacob's engineering would to kind of stand back from these guys, or at least approach them with uh, like an umpire uniform with a mask and everything. <laughs> um, but it, it's an important argument that they're having, a very important debate. And, well, it's a debate. It's a debate. I mean, you're not going to like invent the electric chair and uh, hook it up with non-tokenized blockchain. Right? So anyway. Um, but, I mean, this is the problem. It's like breadcrumbs. You need points right. to measure. Yeah. These tokens are like breadcrumbs. How do you find your way home? You follow they're, the breadcrumbs. Yeah. It's not, there's bad optics behind it because in construction you think alternate forms of value, that sounds like corruption to me. It's, it, it get away from the optics, there's a lot of hype. The tokens are very mechanical. Very that's weird. why I asked if you guys were mutually exclusive in your vision and the answer was no and it doesn't, no. it doesn't sound like you are. It's no. just no. different stages of, of a development of, of kind of... Well, we have our own growth that's coming out in a few weeks, so, so we're, we're already there. More questions? Yeah, hi, this is uh, Ravi Vesh. I'm trying to understand what are the unique benefits a distributed ledger would bring to an asset? And since we all we are concerned about is transferring data, and the chart that you showed looked like the blockchain is sitting in between, so why cannot it be just a centralized database that is transferred between five or six participants that are there on the project? Um, I think it's an excellent question. It's one that comes up a lot. Why can't it just be a database, like a central database? Well, there's a couple of challenges. Let's say you own 100 buildings, and you've sold one of them. So now you've gone from 99 buildings down to 99 buildings. What are you transferring to the new building owner? One one hundredth of your proprietary database, which, by the way, has a data structure that is unique to that product or implementation. So databases at their core have tables, rows and columns. Each database has their own tables, rows and columns. The challenge we've had integrating multiple databases are that we define common views differently. So that's the reason why you haven't seen real integration hit the ground running prior to blockchain. Blockchain takes augmented data, so it takes a block. Think of it as a one-field database. And it's a one-field database that is posted in such a way that is encrypted and shared so everybody can see what that one field is. 
in the case of a public blockchain, anybody can see it. In the case of a private blockchain, people with that crypto key can see it. The bottom line is, is if I wanted to merge my financial system with my project management system, that's sometimes a year to 18 month project. And now we're thinking about, that's within my own company. And everybody's experience, I've been in this industry 20 years. Today, I've been going to this conference for 10. Somebody pulled me over and goes, I, you remember that accounting company you used to work for? We really need to integrate our new project management solution with it. Can you help us do that? I'm like, this is the same conversation we're having. Now, now take the commonality of my own company, trying to integrate two solutions together, and make it between architects, engineers, and an asset owner. I mean, it's just never gonna happen. Um, so yeah, it can't be a central database, it just simply can't. This isn't, uh, this is a not a, this is not a, uh, I don't think it really is a debate, it's just never happened. Um, we ended up breaking everything down to PDFs and files, and that's what we've transported between players. Now, regardless of the model, now we're saying let's take the data and transport it between players at its lowest level. That's, I think, the, the difference. We also saw Clark earlier, they had three people get together and share that database. Um, that would be a great application for, um, for doing so, for having a, sh a shared or a limited shared or a hybrid shared database. But a lot of those things can't be done, can be done on, on, on proven technology already. Uh, that's how Clark, Clark had done it. The problem, of course, is that databases cannot talk to each other in the present state. And you can't you know, preempt databases talking to each other when you're, something comes up and you have to get, get the information uh, that you need at the same time. So you, you're forced to be in a, in a public space so that you can access all the databases. You have to create a place where all the databases can, can, uh, can um, communicate. So this is why we, we just go for the points of risk transfer because they're, they're separate and then, all, and then just manage that position as a decentralized unit itself. So we're decentralizing the engineering profession um, and then the way the engineering profession uh, hits the data is now going to be different, but will have a, a similar or better effect. And let me take a whack at the same question, basically. The, the advantage of having a decentralized shared database like blockchain, that uh, historical records can never be changed, that is secure, is that uh, in the distribution, you're also guaranteeing longevity. You're guaranteeing longevity of a public record, and that longevity is commensurate, again, with the longevity of infrastructure. This is something that once it's started, once it's standardized, which is still the holy grail that's missing, um, it'll be out there really forever. As long as, the, as long as our people, as long as our engineers, and there's construction activity and there's infrastructure, it becomes sort of the de facto repository for information that anyone can access. Uh, and it's the reason why Lloyds of London has existed as an insurance market for so long. They're disintermediated. They've even disintermediated their capital, not just their actuarial data that they used to develop very unique insurance products, but they've been out there since the mid-1600s because they're not just any one company that can go and solve it. They are a disintermediated, distributed market, and it's, you, know, you can do the same thing in infrastructure with its data. Uh, what's this urgency here? I mean, why can't we wait 10 years for it all to, you know, gel and then do it? We can. We can wait. Uh, we can certainly wait. The problem is that the technology and the capital that has been amassed, that I referred to earlier, it doesn't just enable this. It compels it into happening. The will, the technology, and, uh, and the capital is there to make all this stuff happen. Uh, don't be fooled by the fact that we're skiing rapidly down the ski slope of the Gartner hype cycle right now. We are very rapidly. I think uh, we're about to hit rock bottom probably in a month or two. Um, this technology has just, uh, the hype has sort of mimicked the market capitalization of cryptocurrencies, but that has nothing to do with it. These guys have been in this field for seven, eight, nine years respectively, long before blockchain was popular. They're the ones who told me, Dan specifically, uh, when, when I joined IEDC as an advisor, uh, I, I hadn't even heard of blockchain before that. And I, yes, am also a victim of uh, fear of missing out and part of the hype cycle as well. But these are the guys with the level heads and that will stick with this until it comes about. And I think because of the capital that exists, if you look at Block One and their EOS operating platform, they just finished raising $4.1 billion on Friday. Venture capital is completely shut out. You don't need them. There's something called Crypto Valley in Zug, Switzerland that uh, this is where all these companies, Ethereum, Cardano, um, yeah, everyone, yeah, uh, the IBC as well is headquartered there as well. 
they've got their own friends and their own circuit of capital that was raised through all of this initial enthusiasm, and we're now beginning the slow ascent on the right side of the hype cycle. So stay tuned. Dan, urgent thing? Well, yeah, my, my fear is that, that Amazon can pretty much build a stadium right now. They can build rockets. I mean, the, the platform methodology, methodology is more efficient. It is more efficient, and engineers like efficient. If we don't modernize into a network architecture as opposed to a, and that, and that speaks for everybody here, as opposed, as opposed to the traditional hierarchy. It served us well, the hierarchy, but now we have to get to this network platform or else we're gonna be losing, uh, the efficiency is, is just amazing, so. I'll All right, one quick one. Um, we're at zero. Oh, we're at zero. <laughs> so yeah, GitHub just got sold to Microsoft and there's no GitHub for construction or buildings. I mean, blockchain is a great way of getting to what is the source code of the building and creating that GitHub model, so that's what we're doing. Okay. All right, thank our panelists, please. Good stuff. <laughs>